before we get started today with Phil on approaching a new lake, I wanted to let you know we're doing a big giveaway for a huge trip up to British Columbia to fish Stillwater with Phil himself. And uh, this is going to be a big giveaway. We just launched. You can check it out right now at wetflyswing.com slash giveaway. And you can enter to win this trip and a bunch of the gear from our sponsors, Rods, Reels, just like our normal giveaway event. This is going to be a big one. Check it out right now. Today's episode is sponsored by Daiichi Fishing Hooks, a leader in the fly fishing industry and still the world's sharpest hook. Tempered with carbon-rich steel, Daiichi offers superior penetration without compromising the hook's structural integrity. You can head over right now to wetflyswing.com slash Daiichi and check out what they have going and check out these killer hooks. That's Daiichi, D-A-I-I-C-H-I. Today's episode is sponsored by Drift Hook, who has pre-packed fly assortments for every stage of your fly fishing journey. Check out their fan favorite nymph boxes that are hand tied and inspected before being carefully packed into these durable, water resistant boxes. Each kit is organized by species and includes instructional videos and easy to follow guides. Visit wetflyswing.com slash drifthook right now and use coupon code SWING at checkout to get 15% off your next order. Hey, how's it going today? Uh, Dave here again. I just want to give a quick intro and let you know we are bringing the littoral zone to you today. We got Phil again. He's going to be doing a solo show and going to be digging in to get you prepared for your next trip. If this is a brand new lake you've never fished, Stillwater, Phil's going to get you guided in today. Phil is the author of the Orvis Guide to Stillwater Trout Fishing. He's a renowned fly fishing show speaker and a good friend. This is a good uh, opportunity for you to hear from somebody else other than me. This is going to be Phil taking the lead and digging in deeply on a step-by-step guide so you're ready to go for your next lake, even if that lake is brand new. You can check out Phil at flycraftangling.com anytime or reach out to me. And if you have questions, check in and I'll make sure to get those to Phil. Okay. Let's let Phil take the mic and break out the Stillwater magic. Hope you enjoy. Welcome to the Littoral Zone podcast. I'm your host, Phil Rowley. The Littoral Zone, or shoal area of a lake, is the place where the majority of the action takes place. My podcast is intended to do the same to help you improve your Stillwater fly fishing. On each broadcast, I, along with guests from all over the world, will be providing you with information, tips and tricks, flies, presentation techniques, along with different lakes to explore. I hope you enjoy today's podcast. Please feel free to email me with your Stillwater questions and comments. I do my best to answer as many as we can prior to each episode, just before the main content. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy today's show. Today's podcast is about a question I'm often asked, whether that's speaking to fly clubs, at a show, just in conversations with fellow anglers such as yourself, emails, whatever the method, it doesn't matter. It's always the same question. I'm standing on the shores of a lake I've never fished before. How do you approach it? What do you do? Time to experience the littoral zone with Phil Rowley. I'm going to go over today what I do whenever I approach a new lake. And this is a technique or a methodology, if you will, that's worked for me on an all variety of lakes and for all variety of species. Because when we get to a body of water, we're standing there looking out of it. We're optimistic about the day. We want to do as best we can. We want to go home, tell our friends and our families what a great day we've had, what a new lake we've discovered. Perhaps you're trying to convince friends to join you. But at the very least, you want to at least have a chance to get out there and do the best you can. And that's what today's episode is all about. And of course, when we get there, we want to catch a lot of fish, perhaps, some fish, or some big fish or decent fish, especially if that lake is famous for large fish. You want to be able to sort of uh, make your mark and tell your friends that you did well there. and Those big leviathans are there for sure, and they should come and join you. But again, how do you make this happen? What's it all take? And the techniques I'm going to talk to you about today, although I'm going to be talking about stillwater trout fishing, please, please don't think just because I'm talking about stillwater trout fishing, that's what I mean. Whenever I fly fish lakes for whatever species, trout, char, bass, pike, my basic philosophy of how I approach these bodies of water is always the same. It served me very well. I'm very fortunate to have filmed a number of television episodes, particularly for the new fly fisher. 
And I'm often uh, provided with assignments with a bit of a DIY nature where you go to a body of water. You know, I might be staying at a lodge or a resort and I have to go out with my cameraman and figure out what's going on. Or perhaps I'm fortunate enough to be a guy, but they want to see how I approach a new lake. So again, often we're stuck with these challenges right before us and we're trying to do the best we can for the show, for our sponsors, our location providers, all of those things. So when you look at these TV shows, you go, wow. I want to go there. Well, part of that is obviously approaching a new lake, figuring out what to do, and have the best success possible. Because quite often, we might be only filming for a day, a couple of days, three days, if we're lucky, a week. And it's going to take, the more time we can spend, of course, the better our chances. But sometimes you don't have that time. So you've got to have a basic approach to figuring these puzzles out so you can be successful. And then, of course, back in 2007, I believe it was, yeah, I was fortunate enough to participate in the Canadian Fly Fishing Championships. And I'd had very little competition experience, obviously competition amongst friends, but, uh, you know, never had any serious competition uh, experience at that time. I had never fished the venue lakes previously. And in fact, prior to any competition, you're not allowed to fish them for three months. And of course, Spring fishing is totally different from fall fishing, so even if you were able to get on a lake before the three-month uh, window, um, chances are the lake was going to behave totally different, so that wasn't much help either. And of course, my competitors, um, you know, it was a very memorable experience. Nobody's out trying to get each other or anything like that, but obviously they're not going to help you. After the tournament was over, everybody's talking about their successes and failures and what they learned. And of course, on the, the buses that were to and from the venues, we'd certainly be talking about uh, fishing in general. But of course, no big secrets, whether it was location, techniques, or fly patterns were discussed until the competition was over. So I'm not going to get any help from there. And of course, I had to rely on my own teammates. And my job at the time didn't allow me to get to the lakes prior to the venue. Um, you are allowed to practice a few days before, and all of my teammates were there, but I couldn't be there. So I literally came home, I was out of the country, I flew in, got some laundry done, hopped on a flight the next morning um, to the destination, met up with my teammates, and I got a crash course in what they had learned over the two or three days prior to the competition that they were allowed to practice. So I had a lot of notes on napkins, and my first assignment, my first session, was a small lake, it was a bank fishing venue, fishing from shore, nobody was allowed to practice on it. So I was really up against, the odds were against me, I felt. But I managed to persevere, and again, due to the uh, the techniques and the sort of the system I uh, follow, I was able to be quite successful. I was able to catch fish on every session, and you don't want to blank. I'm not going to go into uh, how the competition circuits were. I think that's an, uh, for an episode for another day, and I'll bring on a, uh, a competition angler that's got way more experience than me on it. But we did pretty well as a team. We were successful, four other teammates and I, we were very successful and we took hold of the gold medal. And my part on the team and doing my job, if you will, was based upon the success I'd had fishing lakes previously and the system I used. So this is what we're going to talk to you about today. So what my goals are here with today's podcast is to give you a framework for success. And that starts with planning and preparation, your powers of observation when you get to the lake. I'm going to discuss some on-the-water strategies and tactics, and I'm going to touch on fly patterns a little bit as well, because the fly patterns you use and the situations you use them in can have a bearing on your success as well. So Skeet Reese is a professional uh, bass angler. He's on the bass tour, and he's got a great statement that really sums up the preparation you need to do to be successful. And his quote is, proper preparation prevents poor performance. And that's a statement, a quote that I definitely agree with. Preparation is key. You can do a lot of planning and preparation prior to leaving. That's what it's all about, planning and preparation. Before you even leave the driveway, you're sitting at your kitchen table having a cup of coffee, your favorite beverage, you can do a lot of research and start getting yourself set up to be successful when you finally arrive on the shores of that new lake. So obviously you want to talk to friends and colleagues, people who have perhaps fished the lake before, any insight you can get. If you can get a hold of local knowledge, you know, guides perhaps, 
or fly shops or other sources that have fished the lake before and you can pry some knowledge from them or some, some tips, you can't beat it. No matter what your skill and experience on still waters is, it's tough to beat local knowledge because all lakes have their own nuance and their own little quirks. And if you can pick up on those quirks, that's going to make you more successful. And you're going to find a lot of times those little nuances and quirks are not unique to that lake. They may be unique to other lakes as well. And you can take that knowledge and expand it to other bodies of water too. Um, internet forums, not as popular as they used to be, but there's still a few out there. So if you can find some forums, uh, look online in that area, you might find, you know, resources that can help you. You can, you know, search for previous strings on that lake. You could even start a string on the forum yourself and see what happens. Some people may answer you directly. Some others may send you private messages. But again, we're trying for any and all information. Social media, in particular Facebook groups, is another excellent place to look. And I, one I recommend is called Stillwaters. It's a private Facebook group. You can apply. You just answer the questions. And uh, if you're a Stillwater addict and sort of follow the rules of the group, which are pretty common sense, it's all about talking about still waters. Um, you can get some great information there as well. So like the internet forums, you can search that Facebook group, um, see what's been brought up about that particular lake you've been fishing on. If there's no uh, valuable information there or you still want more, again, you can start your own post and see the answers that come in. People may ask you answer your questions directly or they may send you private messages if they're a little worried about having some of their knowledge put out into the public a little bit. And of course, then there's always Google, and we can go through that as well. We'll talk about that a little bit, and bathymetric maps, and again, obviously making sure your tackle's ready to go. So when it comes to Google, you want to Google the lake. So for example, if I was to look at one of my favorite lakes to fish in Montana, Hebgen Lake, it's a big body of water. And one of the first places I go is Google Maps. Now, when you first look up Hebgen Lake on Google Maps, you're going to be taken to a, a, a one-dimensional image of the lake, graphic image, and it's not going to tell you much more than where the lake is, what highways run by it, all of those kind of things. But if you look in the bottom left corner of the map, there's often a, uh, a little icon about an inch square called layers. And when you click on that, it's going to display different views of the lake that you can see that'll aid in your where you're going to go, what you're going to do, those kind of things. So one of the things you want to do is turn the lake to terrain view. This provides more of a 3D graphic that illustrates where the low-lying spots are and where the more mountainous regions are, um, those kind of things, where the hilly areas. Because you got to remember as fly fishers, when we're fly fishing lakes, we're best suited to fish water, I'd say, 20 feet deep or less. And that's for two reasons. First of all, biologically, if you will, the 20 feet deep or less, you can be assured that sunlight can penetrate the bottom in most lakes, depending on water clarity, and anywhere it strikes the bottom on the shoal area or the littoral zone, as this podcast is named after, that's going to stimulate plant growth through photosynthesis, and that's going to provide habitat for food sources, scuds, leeches, caddis larvae. Uh, mayfly nymphs, coronamids, all of different food sources that trout feed upon in lakes and other species of fish feed upon in lakes are going to be found most often in this shallow area. So we want to visit that and spend as much time as we can there because that's the basically the supermarket of the underwater world and we want to put ourselves there so we can intercept a passing shopper in the form of a trout or other fish we're pursuing. The other reason we like that shallow water less than 20 feet deep is we have our whole gamut of presentation options and techniques at our disposal. We can fish strike indicators, we can fish long leaders with weighted nymphs, we can fish a variety of sinking lines, we can fish washing line techniques, we can fish a whole bunch of different things. When you get out into the deeper parts of the lake, there's not a lot of food out there. We're battling the depth of, of the water we've got to manage sometimes. And our presentation options slim considerably. We just don't, aren't as versatile. We don't have as many presentation options at our disposal. And again, this is not an area that fish will certainly go out there and stage. They will feed there for sometimes, but the majority of the feeding is going to be in that shallow shoal area. So that's what we want to target. So when you look at the 3D representation in Google Maps, you're going to see um, mountainous areas, steep areas, and areas that look uh, level and flat. And we want to, if you think about how the surrounding topography is on a lake, 
when we look on the shore, if the uh, angle of, you know, the, the land goes into the lake is on a shallow, acute angle, that's usually going to be an indication that there's going to be shallow shoal areas there. That's where weeds are going to grow. If you look in the map and you can tell, well, wow, that's definitely steep-sided, almost vertical, or like very steep going into the lake, that's going to carry on into the water. Chances are that's going to be a very deep area, not much in the way of shoals, and probably an area we don't want to visit. So again, what we're doing with Google uh, Maps and this uh, 3D view, the terrain view rather, is looking for areas that we're going to be best successful. So if you look at Hebgen Lake, I encourage you to go on there and have a look. It's a great place to visit and uh, wet a line. Um, you're going to see in the eastern side of the lake, the eastern portions of the lake are shallow. You're going to see the Grayling Arm. You're going to see the Madison Arm. Those are areas that are quite shallow. That's where the majority of the trout food is going to be. That's where the trout are going to be feeding. That's an area you want to concentrate. So you can almost eliminate, just on, on that premise alone, you can eliminate over half of Hebgen Lake for places to go if you've never been. Now, of course, there's other great places to fish on Hebgen but you're there for the first time. You're trying to set yourself up to be as successful as possible. The next thing you can do on that layers is select Google Earth. And Google Earth, as many of you are probably aware, is a satellite image of whatever you're looking at. In this case, my, my reference point is Hebgen Lake. You're going to see a satellite image of the lake you can you know, zoom right in. You can see shallow areas, sometimes underwater structures, sort of humps or sunken islands will be visible. Um, you can see how points of land trail out. And what we're doing is we're slowly building through Google Maps a little roadmap, if you will, of where we're going to go. We're going to look at areas and go, okay, that looks promising. That looks promising. I like looking for things such as drop-offs, points of land, areas of transition such as that, because trout love to have proximity to deep water nearby if they get spooked. Um, so that's a good place to start and venture around. And at least, again, you're building this road map, building a, a laundry list of, if you like, of different spots that look interesting and, and you're probably going to visit. Rather than, this is all about not just pulling up to the lake, staring left, staring right, staring far out, scratching your head, shrugging your shoulders, and moving off in whatever moves you. When we get there, we know exactly where we want to go or have a very good idea of the places we want to go and visit during the day or during however long the stay you have on that lake is. Uh, the other thing you want to try and find, if you can, is a bathymetric or underwater contour map. These are ideal tools to look for. Um, one of the favorite places I like to go is, is a site called Angler's Atlas. It's a British Columbia developed site, but it's expanded its reach into other provinces and states. You can become a member. It's a free membership to join up, and they have a host of uh, different underwater contour or bathymetric maps. You can also find them through state agencies. You can just simply Google bathymetric map of Lake X and, and see what pops up. And what these are so invaluable for is they're going to identify different features on the lake, shoreline areas, shoal areas, drop-offs, where the deep water lies. Perhaps you've never heard of those terms before. I'm familiar with them, or at least my definitions of them. So thought I'd go over them. So the shoreline area, let's say that's the area, let's say one to five feet deep, that area right around the margins of the lake, very shallow. Typically, this is where fish are going to be early spring, late fall, early in the day, late in the day. They're going to be early in the spring. They're going to be there because that's where the oxygen is in the fall. They're stocking up um, for the winter months that are coming up if the lake ice is over. So they're going to be feeding heavily in there because they're rich in, in uh, aquatic vegetation, at least in the productive lakes. That's where the food is. Again, we talked about that earlier. And early and late in the day, because there's not direct light on the water, so the fish are going to feel a little more secure in there. The shoal area, the littoral zone, as I mentioned earlier, is that anywhere the sunlight touches the bottom. And when sunlight touches the bottom, it stimulates plant growth through photosynthesis. Very important. I know I've said it before, but I'm just stressing it once again. Um, these are the places you want to visit because that's where trout food is. Think of it as a Costco, the superstore, the Safeway, or the underwater world. That's where fish are going to shop, or in this case feed, and you want to be there as well with our presentations and our patterns. The drop-off area is a transition from the shoal to the deep water zone where, you know, where it could be 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, 90, or even deeper, uh, depending on the lake you're fishing. This is a great spot. I love drop-offs because trout love to, it's like a game trail. They love to cruise along these drop-offs. Uh, make little forays onto the shoal, have a couple bites to eat. The security of deep water is nearby. If they get startled or spooked, they can get out into the deep water and, and uh, you know, avoid uh, whatever scared them. And drop-offs can be very steep, like cliffs. They can be very shallow, uh, just a gradual increase in depth. 
So these are places you want to visit. And we could spend a whole episode, and we probably will in the future, talking about drop-offs in particular. And then there's the deep water zone. This is where trout will go when they're, you know, frankly, I say when they're not happy. It could be environmental changes such as weather change. Um, they're not feeding. They'll slide off into the deep water. They're not necessarily going to go down to the bottom because many times there's just not enough water down there. And again, another great subject for a future podcast is to talk about how lakes work. You know, a great subject because you need to know that um, because it tells you at any point in the season where your highest percentage is going to be to find fish. So again, we're trying to concentrate on the drop-off and shoal areas, and that's what we're looking for both with Google Maps and with bathymetric maps. So what is a bathymetric map? You look at it, it's like a 20,000-foot view of the lake, and you'll look on the map and you'll see all these lines uh, tight together, spread apart, or someplace in between. And these lines join areas of equal depth. So when those lines are compact and tight together, that indicates a rapid change in depth. If they're spread out and there's distance between them, that's a gradual change in depth. That could indicate a shallow shoal, depending on obviously how deep those marks are. And they're usually marked in feet or meters, and you just have a look at them. And again, we're building a route map. We're going to look at an area and go, okay, there's a point of land. I like that. There's a nice steep drop off. I like that. There's maybe a saddle where you've got two points coming out from opposite sides of the lake, and they're going to form a little underwater ridge. Trout and other game fish love to cruise that because it'll be shallow on the top and sloping away deep edges. That's another spot to investigate. So again, you're building that route map. You're looking at certain spots and you're getting comfortable. You're basically developing a mental picture of this lake where you're going to go and how you, you know, where you're going to spend your time. You're just not going to be driving aimlessly or paddling aimlessly all over the place in a random manner. There's a method to your madness, if you will. So the last thing we want to make sure we're prepared about before we leave the driveway, everything's prepared rather, and that's our equipment. Because if our equipment's in order, we can then focus on discovering this new lake and finding those fish. If you're still at the lake figuring things out, getting gear prepared, finding out what you forgot, what you're low on, um, that's going to frustrate you. It's going to get in the back of your mind. It's going to nag away at you. You want to make sure you're always prepared with your equipment. So that's making sure your rods are in order. You've got the right line weights. You have and accidentally misread a, a rod tube or a rod blank and brought a nine weight instead of a six weight because you read it upside down. So make sure you got enough rods to do the job. Typically when I get on the water, I like to have a minimum two to three rods already strung. And the reason being is when you go to make a presentation change, it's easy to do. You just pick one up, put the other down. If you have to string up a new rod and all that, that's going to be probably for us, some of us, a mental barrier. We don't feel like doing it. It's going to limit our approaches. You're going to get off the water and find out you probably should have made the change if you bump in and talk to another angler. Make sure you brought the right lines for the job. You know, there's lots of still water fly lines out there uh, specifically for still waters, and it can be a little overwhelming. But whenever you head on the water, you always want to make sure you have a floating line that will enable you to fish indicators on long leaders. Even though we use floating lines on lakes, we don't get the dry fly opportunities um, that our river and stream anglers do. Our river and stream fly fishers, we spend most of our time fishing subsurface. So you want to look for a fly line that's actually going to be capable of throwing indicators and long leaders. Um, you want to have a clear intermediate, a line that sinks anywhere from one and a half to two inches per second. That's a great line for casting and retrieving. If you want to paddle around in a float tube, you control with it. Um, it's great for working shallow areas with leeches and minnow patterns and damselfly nymphs and dragonfly nymphs, those kind of things. The slow sink rate allows you to slowly retrieve patterns because remember nothing in the lake has a rocket pack attached to it and scooting around like the Mandalorian or anything like that. So you want to make sure that you can retrieve your flies in a slow and natural pace and not have that sink rate of the line overpower you. And then you'd probably want to have a fast sinking line. Depending on the depth of the lake, that can be anywhere from a type 3 to a type 7. These are for fishing more aggressively, stripping flies faster where you don't have to worry about the sink rate of the line overpowering your tree. A great line that if you've got to venture out into deep water, you can prospect those depths um, successfully. And you can also fish attractor flies. We'll talk about flies later on in this podcast, breaking them down into different fly categories that I break them down and when I like to use them. I always have a drogue with me. Again, another subject for a, another podcast. But basically a drogue is a big underwater parachute that slows and controls the drift of a boat or a pontoon boat. So you can fish. Your boat is under control. You're still casting and retrieving. 
the drogue is slowing your drift down, making you drift square so you're not spinning around, and you can focus on your presentation. You're still using cast and retrieve techniques. It's a great technique to use when anchoring doesn't work or you're just trying to find some fish and you need to cover water. You can certainly troll as well. I've got to admit I'm not a big fan of trolling because you precede your flies. The one benefit of fishing lock style or with a drogue is your flies precede you as the angler, whereas you troll, you move through the area, and then your flies follow. And in certain situations, that can spook or alert fish and limit your success. I always have electronics with me in the form of a sounder, even on my pontoon boat. The sounder is, is your eyes to the underwater world and uh, really narrows things down when it comes to, uh, you know, your bathymetric map will put you in the park, but um, a sounder will help you find subtle little things that don't show up on a bathymetric map, such as a little trough that may be 12 feet, 13 feet long, and two foot difference. Trout will relate to that, these subtle little things. And you can mark waypoints on some of the more advanced sounders. Invaluable tool to have. Uh, fish finding is just one thing they do. They do so many other things, so many other benefits to having a sounder. Make sure you've got your polarized sunglasses. Protect you from the sun's glare. Protect you from an errant cast. And allow you to look in the water to see uh, different food sources swimming by, to see fish, to see structure, invaluable. You want to have a thermometer with you. Even though I have my sounder, a sounder's transducer where the thermometer is housed is only going to give you surface temperature. Sometimes when you're working off a drop-off or into deeper water, you need to be able to plumb those depths with your thermometer. I have a little cord on it. You can buy a cheap streamside thermometer or you can buy a product called Depth Therm that combines both a thermometer in it and it's got a pressure valve on it that lets water in and at certain pressures more water comes in. It converts that into a simple, easy to read depth scale. So a really handy thing to have. You can get them at uh, typically a Bass Pro or a Cabela's, for example, for about 10 bucks. They're pretty inexpensive. I have a cord, a knotted cord on them, uh, not the cord to the uh, thermometer or depth therm, of course. And then I'll actually paint little marks on that um, rope as well, every three feet or five feet, for example. And I can lower that over the side of the boat, count the marks that go out too. And I've got kind of a backup system for depth as well, both on their depth therm, if it's being a little inaccurate, doesn't seem right, or your sounder, for whatever reason, you forget it, or uh, perhaps the battery dies on it or something. Always make sure I have my throat pump and my vial. Um, because the first fish I'm going to catch, if it's a decent size, I'm going to carefully use that throat pump, examine the contents, and that's going to help guide my presentation, both in presentation style, pattern choice, um, those kind of things. It's always good to know what they're feeding on. You want to make sure you got your nets with you. Yes, I have left the shore and forgotten my landing net. And you get all the way down a long lake at the far end. You may be battery powered with an electric motor. You don't want to venture back. It's not fun trying to land a fish, especially a decent fish without a landing net. Landing net, particularly a wooden one, is invaluable because you can successfully land the net, land the fish, make sure it's got that good fish-friendly netting or a rubber net. You can let the fish rest in there. You can put your rod down. You can manage the fish with both hands because the net floats. It's not going to drift away from you. And even if it does, you can cast to it. I've done that before, certainly. So, <laughs> yeah, if there's a mistake out there, I probably made it. Um, you also want to make a habit of having an aquarium net with you because you can use this to sample along the shoreline or you see something swimming through the water trying to catch it with your bare hands is tough you may not know what it is you might be a little afraid of it it might bite you most there's only a i think back swimmers are about the only insect you need to be concerned with in lakes or perhaps a, a ditisted water beetle larva uh, they have a nasty set of pinchers on their head they're pretty common sense you don't want to pick that up when you see one they're large about fully mature one is about the size of your uh, pinky or ring finger it's quite a big uh, big uh, critter um, but you want to be able to have that aquarium net you can scoop things up and have a look and see what's uh, most prevalent what's most abundant what's available what colors it is how does it move aquarium nets are handy for that you want to make sure your accessories are all topped up too. These are things like, these are the inexpensive things. Let's say under $20, it'll drive you crazy. If you forget your swivels for your indicator rigs, drives you mental. You can't, you know, it just weighs on you. You forget your tippet. You don't run out of tippet. You haven't replaced it from the last time. You forget your nippers. That's my, one of my uh, uh, weaknesses is I'm always misplacing um, my nippers. So I usually have three or four sets. I have one on a lanyard. I've got one on a lid rig set up for my hat. Um, I've got them everywhere because I put them down and I forget where I put them. So I always have more than I need. Binoculars, make sure you have those. That'll save you a lot of endless 
moving around because you can look at an area, look for signs of moving fish, maybe birds working, those kind of things before you ever get there. If there's an angler that's successful, you can glass them. You have a look at them, see what lines they're using. Maybe you can see what presentation techniques they're using. Maybe you can see what uh, the timing between casts, if it's not easy to to see what uh, presentation techniques, what retrieves they're using, or perhaps they're masking them, and that can happen too. Uh, but the timing between casts will give you a rough idea of how fast or slow they're moving their flies. Again, you can see all of those kind of things without impeding on their fishing or wasting your time going over there if nothing's going on. With the bathymetric maps I talked about previously, many times you can print them off and bring them with you. You can uh, now take uh, a sleeve, you get a Staples or an Office Depot, and print them off 8.5 by 11, slide them in there, they're protected. You can use that as a reference, obviously not for navigation, but you can use it as a reference as to where you are, those kind of things. And then a notebook, or nowadays a smartphone, and just make notes, because I still keep a diary of my adventures whenever I go out, and make notes about, obviously, where I was, the day it was, the weather, you know, the food sources that I perhaps pump from a fish, the hatches I, I uh, experienced, the bugs I saw, the areas I fished, the equipment I used, the retrieves I used, the flies it produced, every piece of information you can get, put that, make sure you've got that in your notebook. So those are some of the equipment things you want to make sure you're prepared with before you get out on the water. Okay, so we've got our preparation done. We figured out where we're going. We've got a little route map built on the lake. You know, if you're on a big body of water like Hebgen I referred to, it's big. You're probably not going to be able to fish all that lake in a day. In fact, I know you're not. So it's better to maybe take a chunk of that lake and really focus on what looks to be the prime stuff and work that thoroughly and, uh, and catch fish that way. If you're moving all the time, you're not fishing. So you want to make sure that your route map gets you fishing more often than moving. Um, if at all possible. The only time you're moving a lot is the fishing is slow, so hopefully that doesn't happen. And again, your preparation will help reduce that. Now, you get to the shore. You're standing on there. The best thing you can do is pay attention to your ears and your particularly your eyes. They're the, some of the best tools you have. As I joke at some of my seminars, unfortunately, they're attached to your brain, and your brain doesn't always follow what it believes to be less important organs on the body thinks it knows best and for any of us that have assembled ikea furniture or barbecues we probably know that uh, you know a lot of times we don't always read the instructions and then have to go back because we don't pay attention our brain says oh we can figure this out so that's sort of a, a parallel if you will to how your eyes and ears there so what you want to do is slow down and look if you invest 10 to 20 minutes on the shore it pays huge dividends when you're on the water because you'll have an idea of what's going on right now when you get to that particular lake. So again, slow down, take a look, take a listen, listen for moving fish, birds, those kind of things. You can hear the sounds of them, maybe look over, they may be a type of bird that feeds on insects, give you some clues. So I always go down to the shoreline area, I'll turn over any rocks or logs I see along the shore that I can safely reach. That's where a lot of the food sources trout feed upon hide. So you can look there. You might see scuds, leeches, dragonfly nymphs. You're going to look at the what's being washed in from the main part of the lake. You'll see shucks on the surface, give you clues as to what insects have been emerging. You might see mayfly shucks, coronamid shucks, caddis shucks. These are insects that emerge at the surface. Um, there could have been some recent wind activity. So there may be foam, white foam, literally, that's caused by this wave action that washes up. The white foam is contrast. It traps things. You can see different food sources trapped in the foam and, again, give you clues to what's going on. You want to look if there's any spider webs, have a look around. Um, you know, if you're staying at a lodge or a resort, for example, oftentimes there's spider webs there or in a tree or something. Have a look because they catch all manner of flying insects. So you could see adult coronamids in there, maybe some adult damsels, some mayflies. That again gives you clues as to what the trout could be feeding on, what is emerging. Speaking of emerging, you know, not all insects emerge at the surface. So dragonflies and damselflies crawl out of the water to emerge. So always have a look, not only in the water, but look at the shoreline vegetation, cattails, tules, logs, trees that grow right down by the shoreline. These are areas that these insects will crawl out of the water, climb up on, and transfer into the adult phase and leave those husks left over. Again, clues as to what's going on. You're a sponge right now. You're trying to get as much information as you can. 
And of course, when you stand on the lake and look around, you're now relating the lake to sort of the mental picture you've been drawing. You maybe got your bathymetric map, your smartphone with the Google Maps or Google Earth set up on it, and you're looking around. You're trying to match up sort of those representations, those digital representations or photographic representations of the lake to what you see and link the surrounding topography, for example. Look for those shallow sloping areas into the lake that give you an indication there's probably shallow shoal areas there as opposed to a steep-sided shoreline, which is going to indicate deep water. Again, most of the times we're trying to spend our time in that shallow shoal or littoral zone. So you want to look around. It's amazing what you can see when you look with your eyes. I remember one trip I was filming in Manitoba. We were just standing on the shoreline, kind of gathering, and something caught my eye, some movement. And I looked closely, and it was dragonfly nymphs crawling out of the water. Once I saw one, I saw hundreds. And they were walking out of there like a legion of soldiers and climbing up this old fish shack, and they were transforming right then and there. So I knew right away that a dragonfly nymph and casting it from the shore area, the shallow area, perhaps out to deep water to retrieve my fly in the same directions the naturals were walking along the bottom would be a good presentation choice to start both in fly pattern and presentation technique. Um, again, the spider webs I mentioned, invaluable. So don't, if you see one, always have a look at it. Today's episode is sponsored by Stonefly Nets, putting quality before quantity with their handcrafted custom wood landing nets. Charleston, South Carolina native Ethan Iglehart was bitten by the fly fishing bug in 2014 and shortly thereafter started Stonefly Nets. He now lives in the trout rich waters of the Ozarks and handcrafts some of the sweetest wooden landing nets you'll see. I've been using these Stonefly Nets for quite a while now and I'm excited to dig into another year. Ethan builds these nets custom, and you can select from four sizes and many different wood options. For Ethan, fly fishing is a memory created from a morning on a beautiful stretch of water casting a three-weight bamboo rod that his grandmother gave to his father, and then he passed to Ethan. Ethan is helping us create the same types of lasting memories every time we're on the water with these classic custom wood nets. You can head over right now to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to check out your custom net right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly, S-T-O-N-E-F-L-Y. You support this podcast by clicking through that link to stonefly. Okay, back to the show. So now we're going out on the water. We've done that. We've got maybe a mental image of what is or is not hatching, what bugs are available. And whenever I leave the, the shoreline area, I tend to go slowly, look around, you want to check, you know, as soon as the uh, put the sounder in the water, give it a few minutes to settle and adjust. Um, but then I'm going to check the water temperature because that really governs where I'll go and my presentation techniques. And I'm ideally looking for water temperature for trout in that 50 to 65 degree Fahrenheit range. That's where trout are going to be feeding aggressively, you know, metabolizing their food quickly and efficiently and feeding again. Um, we want to make sure we target water that way. So that's critical to have a look. And of course, if you're fishing for other species, bass, walleye, pike, make sure you're familiar with the temperature ranges those species are most active at as well so you can look for those temperatures as well. You've got your polarized glasses on. As you're moving out, you're looking on and in the water. You're looking on the water for shucks. You're looking in the water for anything that might be moving. You might see a leech swimming by. You might see scuds moving through the water, damselfly noobs moving back and forth or migrating. You always want to pay attention to bird activity. If you see birds, particularly flying low to the water and erratically looking more like helicopter gunships than birds, that's a sign they're feeding on something emerging. You need to go over there and investigate that. If I see that, that will typically trump any kind of route map I have built because I'm pretty rest assured that there are feeding fish beneath the surface. If the birds are feeding on the emerging insects, um, you can be pretty sure that uh, if there's any fish, they'll be concentrated there as well. Of course, you're looking for moving fish. We jokingly call it the two fish rule. So if we see a fish move once, okay, I make a note of that. But if I see a fish move in the area again, it could be the same fish. But often or not, it's another fish. And fish will often shoal up. And you see a fish move, you want to go over there and have a look and see what all the commotion's all about, see what's going on. Because moving fish are active fish and they can be coaxed to the fly. If for no other reason, you feel 100% better knowing there's at least some fish in the neighborhood. 
pay attention to other anglers. I mentioned that. That's where your binoculars to coming in. And then when I'm out there, I'm also thinking about three different ways to finding trout. And I talked about this in my previous podcast, How to Find Trout in Still Waters. And if you haven't listened to that, I recommend you have a listen. But you always want to make sure to follow these three things. At least this is what I use. I'm looking when I'm on the water for factors that provide the trout with comfort, protection, and food. So without getting into, you know, my how to try and find trout in still waters presentation too deeply, the comfort factors are things like water temperature. I mentioned that previously. Very important. Looking for that 50 to 65 degree range if you're targeting trout in lakes. Because it's all about oxygen. The warmer water gets, the less oxygen it holds. The trout become stressed. Their metabolism slows. They don't feed as much. If it gets really, really cold, again, their metabolism slows. They aren't as active as they normally are. So you want to always try and find that sweet spot of temperature if you can. Uh, Weather systems have an impact. So when there's storms and systems like cold fronts moving through, a lot of variables changing in there uh, from rising or falling barometric pressure to light levels to cold air cooling the upper surface and causing a little bit of water displacement. It's like when the weather systems move through, it's like their mother nature's taking the trout's world, which is a bit like a Christmas snow globe, giving it a really good shake. And until things settle out, oftentimes the fishing can be sporadic or slow. So if the system's moving through, for example, I might not spend so much time on the shoals. I might start to work more that deeper water or those drop-off areas where those fish are going to slide off if they're not happy and sort of rest out, you know, sort of stay out and in those areas until that change is passed. And you may maybe not using imitative techniques. You may have to use more attractor techniques. It also pays to understand the seasons of a lake. And it's really important because it tells you where the fish are. So lakes go through distinct seasons. And again, this is an episode unto itself. But typically early spring, right as the ice comes off a lake, trout are going to be shallow because due to winter stratification, water doesn't mix when it's different temperatures. Those trout are going to be in the shallows where the oxygen is. Then the lake is going to become the same temperature soon after ice off. It's going to mix a phenomenon known as turnover. Fishing is generally pretty slow for three to five, seven days after turnover. Uh, because the whole water chemistry is a mess uh, and trout are off the bite a bit and then it'll settle out and the fish are free to disperse. They could be shallow, they could be deeper, um, hatches are going to start. In the summer the lake's going to thermally stratify again. You're going to have warm, less oxygenated water sitting on top of cooler, not always well oxygenated water, but right at the extent of the sun's penetration you're going to have a thermocline form. And this is going to, you know, form a barrier for the fish. And they're going to spend their time near that thermocline, trying to find as much oxygenated water as they can. Rainbow trout, trout in particular, don't spend a lot of time below the thermocline simply because there's not a lot of oxygen down there. Other fish, such as lake trout, which is a char, have adapted to live under the thermocline. So again, relating this to your different species you're trying to um, chase is going to make a big difference. Of course, in the summer months, if you're a bass fisherman, Largemouth bass and, and uh, smallmouth are going to be quite active in those um, warmer temperatures again. So it's going to govern where the fish are as well. And of course, in the fall months, the lake's going to, again, it's coming through the summer. It's still stratified. It's going to cool when those air temperatures drop and the days become shorter. It's going to become the same temperature. It's going to mix again, turn over, and then it's going to head into the winter season in a well-oxygenated state. So it's important to understand the seasons of a lake because that governs where the trout will be at any given time of the season. The next factor I look at is protection factors. These are things that are going to give the trout a sense of confidence and willingness to feed. So we're looking at the water surface because it breaks up light and diffuses light. Structure we talked about, that's what our bathymetric maps and our Google Maps search has done. We are looking for you know, drop-offs, points of land, things like that. We're going to be looking for those kind of areas. Trout love those areas. Vegetation, because it provides food for them, it masks their presence, and through photosynthesis, it provides oxygen. And, of course, trout like to be near that deep water refuge. If something startles them, they can get out of dodge really quick and come back later, uh, perhaps when they're not so threatened. So, again, think about those protection factors. Where are you going to find them, uh, the water surface, Again, structure is probably the most important there because you're looking for areas to channel trout movement, have a deep water refuge nearby. So areas of transition, I call it. Think of edges. Trout love to 
They like game trails. So that could be the drop off adjacent to deep water. It could be the transition from a muddy bottom to a rocky bottom. It could be weeds along the edges of weeds or little channels in weeds. It could be points, sunken islands, weed beds. The area around beaver lodge is always a good spot because beavers are kind of sloppy carpenters. A lot of the uh, sticks and twigs they use for their lodges are underwater. Think of them like an iceberg, which those underwater sticks and, and twigs that are all down there are obviously tough on the fly box because you snag them all the time. But minnows and dragonfly nymphs and other food sources love to hang around there. And again, you want to use your bathymetric map in conjunction with your sounder, if you have one, to help identify that suitable structure. And that came again from our preparation that we did prior to ever getting to the lake. You know, you're looking for areas, like I said, my favorite spots in, when it comes to structure are points of land, drop-offs, uh, little channels or troughs, all of those kind of things. Now, when it comes to drop-offs, not all of them are a steep shallow on one side of the boat really deep on the other sometimes it's a subtle gradual slope and the lake just gets progressively deeper and you're going to notice a light line literally the water is going to appear lighter because the light is hitting the bottom and then at some point the light can't penetrate any further and there's a color change there that seam between the light and the dark water is a great place to prospect drift along or anchor so you can present flies into that um, because fish like that sort of twilight area to the dark side, and they'll cruise right along there, using that as a form of protection. They'll maybe zip in into that lighter, shallower water to feed, but then the deep water's just off in the dark side of that uh, that light line. So light lines are very important. Again, your sounder is critical because it helps find these subtle differences um, that don't show up on a bathymetric map or Google Earth's map or anything like that. We could be talking. Again, I mentioned earlier, maybe there's a 50-foot little trough on a shoal that's a foot and a half, two foot difference. Trout will relate to that. They love those changes. So uh, sounders are great for that. Um, you can drop waypoints on these areas. You can now buy, one of the things I like, I you know, personally I use the Humminbird brand. I have a Helix 7. They all have this feature called Auto Chart Live. And this allows you to, in conjunction with the depth feature and the GPS on the sounder, it creates your own personal bathymetric map when you activate this. And of course you can download it onto a small SD card, print them off, send them to a friend, all these kind of things. Really invaluable because a lot of the small, when it comes to trout fishing lakes, a lot of those small lakes we love to fish that are so productive don't have a lot of sort of public underwater contour maps, if you will. So this feature allows you to, to build your own maps. And every time you go on that water, it's going to fill in the blanks that you haven't you know, mapped before when you paddled over them or cruised over them with your boat or pontoon boat. So really handy feature to have if you can do that. If you're thinking of a sounder, something to definitely consider. You know, sounder is invaluable, but you've got to learn how to use it. So, you know, the YouTube and, and other, the internet are great places to get focused little tutorials on certain features, such as how to set depth, how to read the bottom structure for you. You know, what does a fish look like on a sounder? What doesn't it look like? Uh, what weeds look like? You know, some of them have side scan images. You know, the one I have is uh, got GPS side scan, down imaging, auto chart live, a little bit of mapping on there, all those things. Because what I found is maybe when I got that sounder, I didn't quite know how to use them or understand them or didn't even think to use. But with a little bit of uh, curiosity and education, I found that those features that I didn't realize I have were pretty important. And so you want to make use for them as all. And you've got to learn how to use them because you play with things like sensitivity and depth range sometimes because all lakes are different. If a lake is really clear, for example, you can turn that sensitivity up. That's the sort of the gain, if you will, it's often referred to. But if you are on a lake that's uh, got a lot of suspended matter in it, algae, those kind of things, you have the sensitivity too high. It's going to look like a blizzard down below. You're not going to be able to see anything. So it's really important if you get a sounder to understand how it works so you can use that tool to your advantage and get the most out of it. The last thing is the food factors. And again, this is where you want to go. And I mentioned it throughout looking for those shoal areas because of the weed beds created by photosynthesis. It's important to understand the different life cycles. You don't necessarily have to have a degree in aquatic entomology, but you should understand, you know, what all the food sources are. Do they swim? Do they crawl? Do they dart around? Do they emerge at all? You know, all those kind of things. So when you see them, you can make the right fly and presentation choices. 
And the throw pump is really part of that. I touched on it in the preparation to make sure you have it. But a throw pump used correctly and properly can be invaluable because it tells you what the prey they're feeding on. It identifies, obviously, how big it is. You don't have any negative effect on the prey characteristics because you're pumping something out. Like We call them throat pumps because we're actually sampling the esophagus of the trout, not the stomach, as sometimes they're sold as stomach pumps. We don't want the stomach because we could get yesterday's news or, or news that's old. We want to get just what they fed upon, and that gathers in the esophagus first before it works its way down the throat, down into the stomach where it starts to be digested. It can also tell you the feeding activity, because if you pump live wriggling prey out of a trout, you know that trout just ate that, and you can, if you imitate it, use the right fly and presentation techniques, you can uh, hopefully have some success. It also indicates the depth where the fish are feeding, because once you understand what you're seeing in relationship to where it's most often found, you can tell where the fish are feeding. So for example, if I throw pump a fish and it's got scuds and maybe some chronum and larva bloodworm which lived near the bottom, that tells me that fish was feeding near the bottom. Chances are that's where the rest of the fish are going to be because they all sort of hang out together. Conversely, you pump a fish full of zooplankton. Zooplankton feeds on phytoplankton. Phytoplankton does not like direct light, so it tends to slide down in the water column during the daylight hours and zooplankton being a predator moves with them. That tells you when the fish has got zooplankton inside of it or in a throat sample that that fish is spending a lot of its time in deep water and maybe you should, you know, even though you may have caught that fish in shallow water making a little foray onto the shoal, most of the time it's been spending in deep water where the rest of his buddies or her buddies are, then you can be go out to that area and target that area and be successful. So it's key to understand how to use a throat pump because I find the directions that come with them a little misleading. So what you want to do is lubricate the pump by taking it and over the side of the boat or the pontoon boat and filling it full of water, pump it a couple of times just by squeezing the bulb and get water up inside of it, but squeeze it out, make sure that bulb is completely empty. So it's moist inside and out, um, so it's lubricated, it's going to slide better down the throat. If the fish is struggling in the net, just roll the fish over it to temporarily disorientate them, calms them down. Most times I'm doing this right in the landing net, right beside the boat or the pontoon boat or my float tube, whatever I'm fishing out of. Um, and again, that wooden net really comes in handy for that because we can just lie the fish in there. We're going to try and make sure the fish is comfortable. Uh, it's calm. We're just lying there. Then we're just going to take the throat pump. We're going to hold it with our thumb and forefinger by the bulb, depress it, squeeze it so it's about half compressed, and gently slide it down the trout's throat. And typically you're going to go just to the entrance of the esophagus, right where the gill plates are, the operculum, um, and stop there. Because what's going to happen, as soon as that tip of that pump tube touches the esophagus, the longitudinal muscles of that esophagus instinctively grab onto that tube and create a vacuum. So when you've got this throat pump done correctly, you're going to see when you remove your thumb and forefinger that that bulb stays collapsed because the vacuum is formed. And when that happens, simply withdraw the pump. You're going to hear an audible sucking sound, and it's going to suck or vacuum up that sample in the esophagus into the bulb. And you just let the trout go. The whole process, when you get comfortable with it, takes three to five seconds, very, very quick. And you don't have to touch the food source to get it. So again, this vacuum pump. You want to resist to having any water in there because you don't want to squirt water down the fish's throat first and then suck it out, which is what the instructions suggest to do. This has two things that I don't like about. First of all, firing water down the trout's throat is probably not, you know, we're trying to be as minimally invasive as we can. And doing that seems a little more invasive than necessary. But you can also flush the very thing you're trying to sample out of range of the throat pump and get an inaccurate sample. So again, it's moist. Just get that vacuum and let that vacuum work for you and suck those food sources up into the tube and you can have a look at them. So you squirt them into a, you know, a white container is great. I fill it with water. I then take my the tip of the throat pump. I stab it into that water, squeeze it to suck it up, and then squeeze it back out to expel the contents into there. You don't want to just suck it up over the side of the boat because you could accidentally get things screwed up and backwards and squirt your sample into the lake and go, oh no, I've lost everything I've been trying to find. So you want to squirt that in. And again, the you know an old margarine container is a great thing or a little you know, plastic container you can get at a dollar store or steal out of a, a from, from the cupboard at home or anything like that. Squirt them in, have a look. And again, it's going to tell you what they're feeding on, 
when you understand the food sources and where they're most likely to be found and live in the stages that they're in, um, where the trout is feeding in the water column, and if they're actively feeding. Again, you squirt that sample out and it's wiggling like mad. You know, if you squirt out coronamids, quite often they'll start hatching right there in your sample dish for you and fly away. So you've got to look quickly. Um, conversely, if you squirt something out, there's nothing in it or it's dead and there's nothing moving, that tells you the trout aren't feeding and it's going to adjust your tactics. You may go from a more imitative approach you've been using to one of more attractor where you're going to try and trigger a reaction. So um, when you're on the water as well, there's some things you can do. You want to always cover as much water as you can until you find fish or have some consistent success. So that's, uh, you can do that, you know, vertically and horizontally. So vertically is, you know, using different sink rate lines, different sink times, different depth setting on your indicator setups to always uh, explore different water. Typically, I'm going to try as much as I can to cover that water one to three feet off the bottom. That's where food is found, the majority of the food. That's where trout are going to be comfortable and safe cruising down there. They generally aren't going to come up to the surface too often and expose themselves, so you want to focus on those areas. But, you know, some days you could be fishing 15 feet of water, and for whatever reason the trout are 8 feet down. So you got to be prepared for that. So covering the water vertically and horizontally. That's where droppers come in. If you're in a part of the, the world, the country, the the state, the province that allows multiple flies, you should use them because one of the best, one of the primary benefits of um, multiple flies is you're working two flies or three flies in different depths. And that's what we're trying to do is eliminate depth because trout are in lakes sensitive, you know, typically selective on depth and opportunistic on food. Now covering the water horizontally is fanning the casts around. So when we're or presenting our flies, you imagine the bow of the boat or the stern of the boat rather, or, or out in front of you is not, you know, beside you rather, off your left shoulder if you're right handed caster, is uh, nine o'clock, and your other shoulder, your right shoulder, is three o'clock. You want to position your cast on every hour if you can, always presenting your fly at different angles, different depths to find fish. If you're fishing from an anchored position, which is very common. I enjoy doing it. You have real presentation control. The boat's under control. You can focus on your fishing. You don't want to sit there all day either. So you want to move every 15 to 30 minutes. Um, you know, if I'm fishing flies uh, very slowly and I'm not getting fish and I'm confident in what I'm doing, I might move every 15 minutes. The logic being that that fly has been in the water longer with that slow retrieve um, if something hasn't eaten it, they may not be there. If I'm fishing more aggressive techniques, maybe attractors, or I'm stripping a bait fish pattern or a leech a little more brisk, I might move every half hour or 20 minutes or so because simply that those flies moving through the water a little faster may not have had the chance to intercept a fish like a slower moving fly would. Hopefully that makes sense. If anchoring isn't working, again, I mentioned cover water. So if you like to troll, troll, but I prefer to drift lock style. I'll throw the drogue out, set the boat up, my boat's in control, I can focus on my presentation, my casting, my retrieving, all those things, and the boat's under control. So the beauty of that is the wind is moving my boat or pontoon boat downwind, the drogue or underwater parachute is slowing and controlling my drift and allowing me to cover water efficiently. It's a great way to work a large expanse of a shoal or the along a drop off until you find fish. And remember your pre planning. All the work you did sitting at the dinner table, the dining room table, wherever you were doing your research, your computer desk, remember those. Pull out your bathymetric map. Look at the route map you're going to go on. Look at the areas you identified as interesting to you, those drop offs, um, points of land, underwater humps, things like that. And make sure you follow that logical path, particularly if you're paddling around in a float tube or rowing around where you, know, you are the motor, you can tire. Or if you're using an electric motor, there's only so much battery life before you start to run out. You want to make sure you're being logical and efficient so you can cover as much water as you can without sort of going from one end of the lake to the other, other side. That's an inefficient way to do it. I, I wouldn't suggest doing that. And of course, make your notes because you could probably come back to this lake one day and you want to build on what you, your previous trip was and not start all over again. So a notebook in your kit bag, in your jacket pocket, or just use the notes feature in your smartphone. There's so much these smartphones can do for us as anglers nowadays. Make those notes, again, for your diary entries later. The other good thing about a smartphone is you see something like a, a particular insect, you may not know what it is. You can take a great picture with your iPhone or your, your smartphone, whatever brand you're using, and email it to a friend that may know or put it up on those 
Facebook groups or internet forums and get that information so you can learn and advance every time because every time we're on the water is another great learning opportunity. That's my, my personal model is you never stop learning because you know I've been fortunate to fly fish lakes for over 35 years now and every day I go out I learn something new. That's the, one of the joys of, of fly fishing in general is just a constant learning that's always going on. Now, when you're moving the fly through the water, um, your retrieves, you want to play around with those too because you're trying to find out what different pace the trout may like. So you're always varying the length of your pull, the speed at which you're uh, moving the fly, the strip you're using or the hand twist, and the pauses. Because you've got to remember trout are sight feeders. they got those big eyes. So often it's the movement of your fly that attracts them, and those pauses are very important because the trout then has that opportunity to pounce on your fly when it takes a break. Because remember, all insects or food sources in lakes, they move a bit, they take a break, they move a bit, they take a break. So we want to make sure our flies move through the water in that similar manner. Again, water temperature has a big influence on this. So if it's cooler earlier in the year, in the fall months, I'm probably going to fish very slow. I may hang things under indicators, let the surface chop, animate the indicator, which translates down to the fly below, and just let the fish find the flies that way. If the fish are, uh, you know, see a lot of anglers, this is everybody's there because it's big trophies and the word got out and you've never been there before and you want to experience some of the success you've seen on social media or heard about, um, those fish, I call them pressured fish. They're going to be seeing a lot of anglers. They're going to be a little more wary, slower retrieves, smaller flies is typically where I go with that to start with to dupe those fish. Again, you could have poor weather um, as well. You're going to fish slower, maybe fish more of the deeper water adjacent to a drop-off or on the drop-off itself. You can use active retrieves to cover water and entice a strike. So fish don't always take our flies out of a feeding response. So an aggressive brisk retrieve might trigger a grab. You can get that throat sample out of that fish if it's the right size and right opportunity to do it, and then refine your presentation there. And again, I said earlier, always work your your different angles both and your depth. So different sink rates on your lines, different retrieve speeds, different depth settings on your indicator, and fanning those casts around to cover as much water as you can whenever you're casting and retrieving a fly. I mentioned droppers. If you can use them, I encourage you to do it. They allow you to fish different depths, different pattern types, different colors, Two flies weigh more than one, so it's an added source of weight. If you're fishing a floating line system, you need to get the flies down. Maybe there's some wind activity that's creating wind-induced current, which can inhibit the sink rate of your fly. You can use a bright, loud uh, fly or a larger fly as an attractor. Fish see that fly from a distance, come in to investigate. They may eat it, they may not, but they come in, they look, and they may see a smaller, more natural fly up or down to that fly and take that as well. So that fly has pulled those fish in and can have them um, have a look at it then. Generally, when I'm fishing cast and retrieve, I like to keep my flies fairly well spaced apart, a minimum three feet, typically five feet apart. Because you got to remember, they don't fish that way vertically. Uh, because as soon as you start the retrieve, everything kind of pulls up, and they may only be a couple feet apart when you're stripping them back. Now, if I'm fishing uh, indicators, I'm going to probably separate them by about 24 inches or 2 feet because they fish vertically. Now, if I'm fishing, if I do get the good fortune to fish it for rising fish, I'm probably going to keep the spacing about 3 feet apart because if a fish rises, I want my flies to land in the proximity of that rise so I have the best opportunity when those flies land or splat on the water. The lateral line of the fish could pick those up and come and get them. I have a better chance because I've got more flies in the immediate area if they were spread apart. And um, that's basically with droppers. You want them, if you can, I encourage you to use them because they're such an invaluable way to, you know, it's such a great tool to use. It's not about catching multiple fish. In fact, that's the last thing you want. Uh, has it happened to me? Absolutely sure it has. Not very often. And when it does, it's usually pure chaos because you've got a fish going one way, another fish going the other. Um, it's usually very short and abrupt. Two flies gone, leader destroyed. You're kind of shaking. That's not what you want. You know, typically, most times the fish are going to eat just the one fly, and that's it. About the only time I don't use droppers is obviously when it's not legal to do so. You don't want to do that. 
But if I'm fishing in a very weed choked area and I've got a, a technique that's working, um, obviously if you hook a fish in those weedy areas, the fly in a fish's mouth is not a problem. It's now the other fly, the dropper, that's the problem. And it could hook another weed or obstruction and then break the fish off. So that's about the only time. But typically if it's allowed, I've always got a minimum of two flies on. That's probably what I use the most. If it's really tough fishing and I'm allowed, I may slip the third fly on. And there may be other jurisdictions I'm aware of. You can fish more than that. But usually two flies is a good starting point and get comfortable doing it. So let's talk about fly patterns to sort of round this up. Because when you're on a new lake, you want to, you know, what fly patterns money to use, what categories. And I break my flies into three basic categories. Suggestive flies, imitative flies, and attractor flies. So what do I mean by that? Well, a suggestive fly is a fly that looks like everything and nothing. A woolly bugger is probably a perfect example of that. It could be a leech. It could be a minnow pattern. It could be a dragonfly. It just looks buggy and good to eat. A hare's ear nymph is a great suggestive stillwater pattern. It could be a mayfly nymph. It could be a scud. It just looks like food to a fish. Suggestive flies are great flies to start a day out with. When you haven't, you may have got to the lake, you know, early. We don't have to be necessarily at the crack of dawn if you, unless you like to do that. Um, but you may be there before any hatch activity has started. So these are great flies to search the water, catch a fish, careful use of the throat pump, see what's going on, refine your presentation from there. Suggestive flies are great when there are obviously no hatch early in the day and in the fall months in particular when majority of your stillwater hatches are done and trout are just feeding on whatever they can get their mouths on to stock up for the winter head. That's a great time to use a suggestive fly. Imitative flies are when fish are being fussy and selective, when they're specifically targeting a particular food source. It could be scuds, it could be mayfly nymphs, it could be damselfly nymphs. Probably the most imitative situation you're going to get into on lakes is fishing coronaments because size, the shape, the stage, the you know whether the, the pupa has trapped gas lot, it's early in the emergence, it doesn't have any. These are all factors that can play in that can drive you to fits but also provide you with some of the most memorable stillwater fishing you're going to have on productive lakes um, for trout. Again, I mentioned earlier, you want to give every fly a chance of working. So, you know, I'm more of a presentationist than a fly pattern person, even though I tie a lot of flies. Um, I do like to believe in the presentation is much better than the pattern itself. So I have an analogy I follow called DRP. And what does that mean? Well, that stands for depth retrieve pattern. That's sort of the logic I use to work my way through things. So the best pattern in the world, everybody blames the fly and it's not the case. You know, typically um, if you're being successful, it's usually because you've got your fly at the right depth, you're moving it at the right pace, and then the fish accept it. Now, is pattern important? Sure it is. But if you have the best pattern in the world, if you don't have it at the right depth and don't move it at the right pace, you're probably not going to have any success. So, for example, if I'm in an area, let's say I anchored up in an area, looks great, um, maybe I've seen, if, uh, you know, I haven't seen any signs of life, but, you know, no fish moving or anything like that, but it looks promising. It's a drop-off. It's a point. It's a place I like to fish. There's weeds nearby, or I'm fishing right on the edge, whatever. It's a nice spot. And I put my flies out there. I'm fishing a fly I've perhaps caught fish on before. It seems appropriate for the season. You know, my on-the-shore observations, my shoreline observations suggest, you know, I saw damsel nymphs emerging. I saw signs of it. You know, I'm in an area where damsel flies are. There's a few flying around. And uh, so I'm going to start with a damsel fly nymph and I'm going to, you know, retrieve that fly and work it hard. And I don't catch anything. And I believe I'm at the right depth. I'm moving that fly at the right pace and I'm not catching fish. I'm probably going to move before I change fly because the first thing you need to catch a fish is to have some fish there. So again, think depth retrieve pattern. Don't always blame the pattern. Make sure you're presenting that fly at the right depth and moving in the right way. And again, most people new to lakes don't let their flies sink long enough and don't move them slow enough. So think about that before you start going crazy, changing fly patterns out. And when I do change, a good habit to get into is have a little day box or or a little foam strip, or a little, you know, you can buy uh, magnets um, to put your flies on. Lidrig is a company that makes some great uh, magnets there. And as you take the flies off, you can put them on those magnets, let them dry out, and you can see your progression. So when you go to make a next change, 
and you're like, oh, okay, I've already tried that. Maybe I'll try this instead. Rather than putting it back in the box, damp, it could rust or get damaged, and you forget what you were doing, and you end up you know, using a fly an hour later that you'd already used and hadn't had success with. So again, uh, very important. And then the last uh, category I mentioned or haven't talked about yet is attractor patterns. So these are patterns designed to trigger a response. And again, because fish don't always take our flies out of a feeding response, we can appeal to them because they're predatory in nature. So they're aggressive. Trout are curious. Fish are curious. Their hands are their mouths. So they put things in their mouth to sample them, right? So they see something that looks a little weird or off. They're going to maybe put their mouth on it and try and mouth it a little bit and see what's going on. Doesn't matter. Flies in their mouth, fair game for us, I would say. And also territoriality. We might strip a fly um, through an area close to them. They don't like it. They snap out at it, snap it. These are situations for attractor flies. So generally, these are flies, you know, you think of, if you've heard of these names before, like UK patterns are very uh, known for their attractor fishing and attractor flies. They've done a wonderful job developing this, this style of fishing. But flies like boobies with foam eyeballs, uh, fab with a split foam tail, blobs, apps, worms, flies like this, what's it? So that's a, basically a blob with a, a, a mop tail. Again, attractor techniques are a subject for a future podcast. These are flies you want to have in your box. They're typically larger, they're gaudier, and we move them at pace, generally. Um, we're going to fish them aggressively because we're trying to trigger a reaction, a non-feeding reaction. These are great flies to, to fish if fish are in trout are in deeper water. They seem off due to environmental conditions. The suggestive flies aren't working. The imitative flies aren't working. This is a great way to trigger a response from a fish. Again, careful use of that throw pump and see what's going on to be successful. So that's my basic manner in which I approach a lake. Hopefully I've given you a framework that you can adapt and use or perhaps copy this one verbatim and use to be more successful the next time you visit a lake for the first time. So again, it all starts with your planning and preparation. You can do a lot, set yourself up for success at home before you ever leave the driveway. So you're going to look at things like Google Maps, Google Earth, Find bathymetric maps. Find out any local knowledge. Do some internet research through forums or Facebook groups, things like this to find information. Talk to your friends and colleagues. Then you're going to get to the lake. Stem your enthusiasm. You know, tone it down a little bit. Invest 15 to 20 minutes and have a snoop around. Turn over those rocks and logs. Look for spider webs. Uh, look for cast shucks of, like damsels and dragons that have crawled out of the water to emerge. And when you're leaving the shoreline area, don't be in a rush. Have a look around. You've got your polarized glasses on. Look in and on the water for signs of a hatch, anything like that. That's what you want to do. Again, and follow the route map you built through your planning and preparation stages. Look for those areas. Look for structure. Drop, again, I've said it a number of times, but I really love drop-offs, points of land, anywhere you've got a shallow area to feed with a deep area nearby for safety and security. We talked about some of the on-the-water strategies and tactics, you know, covering water by trolling, or I prefer using a drogue to always, you know, search the water vertically and horizontally. So vertically by the, the depth you set your patterns at when your indicator at, when your indicator fishing, the sinking rate, the sort of the sink rate of the line you're using, how long you let that line use. Do you move the fly fast? Do you move it at a moderate pace? Do you move it erratically? All these things that you're going to do, you want to do that as well. And we talked about fly patterns, too. Uh, again, those three basic types, uh, categories, I break them in. Suggestive flies, great for early in the day, late in the day, in non-hatch periods, early in the spring, before any hatches get going because it's still too cool, and again in the fall months because all the hatches are done. And anytime fish do not seem to be focused on any kind of emergence that's going on. Then you have your imitative flies. These flies step up when fish are really keyed into a certain food source or a certain hatch, then you need those imitative flies. And again, I said earlier, the arguably the most important one, the most imitative one you're going to run across in still waters are coronamids, midges, buzzers, whatever you want to call them. Those are the perfect example of a really imitative fly and the techniques that go with them. And then when fish aren't feeding for whatever reason, then you're going to break out the nasty stuff, the attractors. These are flies designed to trigger a reaction through territoriality, aggression, or curiosity. They're typically larger, they're gaudier, and we fish them at pace. So again, get that non-feeding response out of a trout to catch a fish. Again, you can use your throat pump. 
and sample that fish, see what it's been eating, and see if you're going to continue to use attractors all day, uh, such as you do your throat pump, there's nothing in the fish or everything's dead, that fish isn't actively feeding, or conversely, you pump that fish and it's full of wriggling something or other, then you're going to imitate that wriggling something or other and uh, you know hopefully catch some more fish that way. So hopefully this works out. This has been a... a um, strategy I've used for many, many years. It's worked both for the different lakes. I have the good fortune to fish across North America and down into South America now with the trips I do down to Argentina. Um, it's worked for trout. It's worked for char. It's worked for bass, for panfish, for pike. Uh, again, once you take this basic strategy I've got and sort of apply it to the different fish, you know, because they, they all have, obviously all fish, you know, they live in the same environment, so have a lot of similarity, similar boundaries to things that govern how they will act and behave but they all have their little traits so just adapt them for that it's worked very well for me again if you want to learn more about still water fly fishing i encourage you to pick up my book the orvis guide to still water trout fishing you can get that through any book retailer or you can order it from mine and brian chan's online store stillwaterflyfishingstore.com there'll be links to that down in the show notes uh, and again, there's a, a whole uh, chapter on, on how to find fish and sort of spread throughout is sort of my philosophy on still waters. It's worked very well for me, and I hope you find this valuable and work for you. So I want to thank you once again for joining me on the Littoral Zone. If you've got any questions or uh, comments, please let me know. Uh, you can email me directly at flycraft at shaw.ca or reach out through my uh, website, flycraftangling.com. If you go there, please uh, consider joining my newsletter list. I provide educational content information on trips and uh, schools I'm doing, all kind of manner of uh, communication that way. So a great way to stay in touch and learn more about still waters. And uh, if you've got any ideas for future episodes, please let me know. Um, we've got lots of great content coming up. So again, thanks for spending the time to uh, listen to what I had to say about, about how the philosophies I use to find how do I approach a new lake. And we'll look forward to seeing you on a future episode. That was Phil Roy on the Littoral Zone, part of the Wet Fly Swing Podcast and Swing Outdoors. I want to give a big thanks to Phil for uh, sharing all the knowledge today, and we're excited that next episode is probably going to be coming out next month. We're trying to space these out uh, a month or maybe a few weeks apart, and so you're going to get Phil the chance. I think the next one he's going to be going and uh, interviewing another guest here on the show. I just want to remind you, we got the big Stillwater giveaway going on right now. You can enter this trip uh, with Phil to Northern Lights Lodge right now. Go to wetflyswing.com slash giveaway and, uh, and you can enter. You can also go in the show notes and enter at that link down there in the show notes if you get a chance. Uh, this would be your best chance to uh, check in. I hope you're enjoying these podcast episodes with Phil. Um, I'm excited to keep digging into this and it's been really cool to have Phil to mix it up a little bit with Phil here and go deep on the guy who has all the knowledge and a lot more than myself. So uh, check in anytime. If you have a question, we could add it to an upcoming episode. Uh, that's Phil at flycraftangling.com, or you can check in with me anytime as well. All right, that's a wrap. We're going to wrap up the littoral zone right now with Phil, and we are going to get off to our other tasks that we have going. Great to have you on today and looking forward to uh, talking to you and seeing Phil on the next episode. Thanks for listening. Get out there, explore your local lakes, explore lakes distant from your home as well. Fish as much as you can. And remember, you never stop learning. We'll see you next time.